Larry, thanks uh, very much, and um, uh, thank you, Mariana, for that uh, earlier advertisement. It's a pleasure uh, to be here, at least I think it's a pleasure. Uh, I, I have got, however, a couple of problems. First of all, you're probably all rather grumpy, uh, having been rushed downstairs and then rushed upstairs. Uh, it's often bad enough talking just after lunch, because that's when people go to sleep. Uh, it's even worse when everybody's got sort of half-digested food in front of them uh, and uh, are therefore feeling very grumpy. Um, I also have the problem that I am much less an expert on the issues of this conference uh, than uh, many people uh, here. And that is because although I've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about the financial system uh, over the last four years, and as Larry says, I'm writing a forthcoming uh, book on it, my focus has almost inevitably been not on the positive things that the financial system has to do, or even why it doesn't do the positive things, but has been primarily focused on how do we stop it doing negative things? Uh, how do we stop it occasionally blowing up the world uh, and producing, as it has post-2007-8, a severe post-crisis uh, recession? However, I hope that some of my comments drawn from that experience and drawn with the pro process of struggling with the financial system after the crisis of 2008 uh, have some relevance to the debates that you've had uh, last night uh, and this morning about the positive role that finance has to play uh, in investment uh, and innovation. And at least I hope that my perspective will help us define some debates we have to have. And I'm going to end up with some, some questions that I think uh, I don't fully know the answer to, uh, but I think are worth uh, asking. Um, let me start with the fact that finance got much bigger. Over the last 50 years, finance has come to play a far bigger role in modern advanced economies. In the 1950s, the total finance sector in the US accounted for about 2.5% of GDP. By the 1970s, that was 4.5% of GDP. By 2007, that was about 8% of GDP. You can run the measures on some other, other uh, uh, metrics, such as growth operating surplus or share of equity value, and then finance looks even bigger. There is a very similar growth pattern which has been documented by Andy Haldane uh, in the UK. In other countries, the absolute figures are, are often yet uh, less, but the direction of change is the same. Finance is, in our economies, sort of three times bigger than it was in the 1950s. Uh, why is that? Well, actually, I think we can break down why finance got bigger into two big elements. I mean, there, there are actually multiple elements. Not lots of different aspects of it uh, got bigger, but there are two which dominate. One is that real economies got more leveraged. They borrowed more money. So if you take all the advanced economies together, in the early 1950s, they had private sector debt to GDP of about 50%. And by 2007, that had grown to 170%. So the size of what the financial system did vis-a-vis -vis the real economy in the debt markets had got much bigger. And by definition, for every bit of debt on the asset side of the financial system balance sheet, there had to be a liability, which was an asset of the real economy. There had to be more money, more deposits, more bonds, more fixed interest uh, uh, instruments of some sort. So part of the reason why the financial system uh, got bigger is it did more vis-a-vis -vis the real economy, in particular in the arena of debt rather than equity. Uh, the other reason why it got much bigger is that for every unit of activity vis-a-vis -vis the real economy, it, for reasons which are a little bit difficult to understand, did far more units of activity with itself. It did far more trading uh, with itself. It created a set of instruments which were intensively used within the financial system itself, uh, such as uh, derivatives. So if you take a whole series of indices which relate a financial activity to a real economy activity, you get a dramatic increase in those ratios. You get far more foreign exchange trading relative to the value of actual real trade. You get an explosion of uh, derivatives which hadn't previously existed. And in particular, you get a change in the shape of the balance sheets of the major international banks. If you looked at the biggest banks of the world back in the 1950s, you know, an ordinary person could understand them. Because broadly speaking, on both the asset and the liability side, there were a set of assets which were claims on 
households, companies and governments. And on the liability side, there were a set of liabilities to households and companies. If you look at the balance sheet of Goldman Sachs or Deutsche Bank or Barclays today, you will find that the majority of the balance sheet is a set of claims vis-à-vis -vis other parts of the financial sector. It's Barclays to Deutsche Bank. It's Deutsche Bank through Goldman Sachs with a huge explosion of derivatives activities, trading activities, uh, interbank activities. So those are the two reasons why finance got much bigger. And I think we have to ask a searching question about, well, was that a good thing? Was it good that finance got so much bigger relative to the real economy? Now, in other sectors of the economy, we wouldn't even ask that question. We'd consider that a sort of illegitimate question. If the expenditure on restaurant meals, and therefore the output of the restaurant sector, grew from 2% of GDP to 8% of GDP, you'd say, well, that's because people have decided they want to spend more of their income on restaurant meals and less on cars or iPads or you know, clothes, and that's up to them, and so the restaurant fig uh, sector got bigger. But finance is very different, and it's also, in some sense, more important. It's very different because it's not a consumer good valued in itself. Nobody, pretty much nobody, gets up in the morning and says, oh, what shall I do today to really enjoy myself? I think I'll go out and consume some financial services. Now, <laughs> there may be some people in this room who do this, but that's because you're odd. You're sort of uh, fascinated by financial services. But most normal people uh, don't uh, do that. Finance is not valuable in and of itself. It's valuable if it is performing functions vis-a-vis -vis the real economy and performing them well. And obviously it performs uh, vital functions, it connects savers and investments, it has a crucial role in the mobilization and the allocation of capital. So it is crucial for us to ask questions, is it doing it both as cost efficiently as possible, I, could we have the same service at 4%, not 8% of GDP, and spend the other 4% of GDP on something else? And is it doing it as effectively as possible? Is it performing that mobilization and allocation role as effectively as possible? Now, before the crisis in 2007, the very predominant point of view of finance and macroeconomic theory expressed in many books and uh, articles was very positive about the growth of the financial system. And broadly speaking, the story which was told was that financial deepening, I'm not quite sure what I meant to do with that. It's for me. Oh, oh, oh sorry, right, good. <laughs> uh, there was a very positive story about this process of financialization and financial deepening. And I think it had three elements. First, there was a very strong assertion that markets in financial instruments are efficient and rational, and that they are more efficient the more liquid they are. That liquid equity markets achieve efficient processes of price discovery, as defined by the efficient market hypothesis, and that the more liquid they are, the more trading they are, the more efficiently they do this. So that if, for instance, turnover as a percent of equity market capitalization has gone up, you will find many aspects of the literature where say, well, that must be a good thing. The market has become uh, more uh, efficient. Secondly, it was very strongly argued that debt contracts were a good thing. Debt contracts were a good thing because they enabled a mobilization of capital which might not occur if every investment in the economy had to take a debt, uh, an equity form. If you had to, when you invested in a project, take an equity investment, you wouldn't have invested so much. People, companies or uh, households in particular, wanted the certainty of debt contracts, of what the economists called non-state contingent contracts. And so there was a lot of reference in the literature to the necessity of financial deepening, focused in particular on the emerging markets, but with arguments that if you looked at a country like India, with private credit to GDP of only 10%, if it had private credit to GDP of 30%, it would be better able to grow. There was a positive story about the role of debt contracts in capital mobilization and allocation, which tended to be favorable for financial deepening. And then thirdly, there was an argument that what had occurred in the arena of securitization, credit structuring, and derivatives 
was that we had extended to the credit and debt markets the advantages of liquid and transparent prices, liquid trading and transparent prices, which we had always had in equity markets. And so it was a good thing that we had taken debt contracts off the illiquid books of banks, turned them into uh, liquid traded credit securities, which then, the story was, could be allocated round uh, the economy and end up in the hands of the investors, best place to absorb the specific risk and return of specific securities, which had been tailored to more precise combinations of risk and return by the glories of securitization CDOs, and of course, which could be hedged by the glories of CDS. So broadly speaking, the pre-crisis orthodoxy was positive about liquid and highly traded equity markets or all other categories of markets, positive about an increase in credit as a percent of GDP, and positive about the developments of securitization and derivatives, which we tend now to mean refer to as shadow banking. And the assertion was that those changes had not only made the financial system more efficient, doing its job of capital mobilization and allocation more efficiently, but that it had made the financial system and therefore the macroeconomy more stable. If you read the IMF Global Financial Stability Review of April 2006, only 15 months before the biggest financial crisis uh, in modern capitalism, you will, hear, you will read a paean of praise to the great glories in which structured credit and derivatives and trading and shadow banking have made the financial system more stable. Now, I think clearly, and seen from my point of view of stability and why the macroeconomy uh, goes wrong, uh, we have to question that orthodoxy a little bit uh, after 2007 and 2008. Indeed, I think we have to uh, question it in lots of different ways. First, in relation to equity markets or liquid traded markets in, in, uh, in total, I don't believe in the efficient market hypothesis, or at least I fundamentally believe that the things which are true about the efficient market hypothesis are trivial, and the things which could be important are untrue. Uh, it may be true that in liquid traded markets there is no free lunch, that it is very difficult to spot uh, riskless arbitrages. It is not true that the price is right. And the two different concepts of there is no free lunch and the price is right are two very different uh, uh, concepts. I think that all liquid traded markets are subject to herd effects, to irrational effects of the talk thought that Robert Schiller and George Akerlof and others have written about. And that that has a set of consequences for the role of liquid traded markets and for other bits of the ec ecosystem of finance, such as venture capital, uh, in the processes of capital allocation. But I'm not going to talk about that because there's others who know much more about that. That's something on which uh, Mariana and others have written the role of equity markets, of whether they do or do not serve uh, long-term purposes. The third point is, as well, I think, was also totally wrong. I think in retrospect, the developments of shadow banking, of securitization, of derivatives, and all the sophisticated, or supposedly sophisticated, risk management and trading mechanisms that we put in place, far from making the system more stable, essentially took the dangerous potential instability of the credit and asset price cycle and hardwired and turbocharged it. That's my fundamental analysis of what happened with securitization, structuring, derivatives, and shadow banking. But again, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the middle one. I'm going to talk about, were we right to consider that the growth of credit to GDP was a good thing? Now, what do textbooks tell us about bank credit within the economy? Well, broadly speaking, if you pick up an economics undergraduate textbook, or even some advanced uh, uh, bits of academic literature. And insofar as they describe the banking system, what they say is this. Banks take deposits, savings from households, and they lend it to businesses stroke entrepreneurs to finance capital investment projects, thus achieving both an intermediation of saving and an efficient uh, allocation between alternative capital investment projects. The problem with that dis prob a description of what banks do, and a problem right at the core 
of understanding financial instability and the problems of the financial system in a modern economy is that as a description of what modern banking systems do, those words are completely mythological. And indeed, they're wrong in two fundamental senses. First, they're wrong because banks do not just take existing money and savings and intermediate it. They create money, credit, and purchasing power. In the way that the Austrian economists, such as Ludwig van Mises and Joseph Schumpeter uh, and uh, Hayek described. And so, obviously, the question of who they give that new purchasing power and credit to who is empowered with that new credit is absolutely fundamental uh, to the dynamics uh, of the e economy. But the second way in which they are mythological, in which they misdescribe uh, the system as it is at the moment, is in believing that most credit is extended, or that all credit is extended, to businesses stroke entrepreneurs to fund new capital investment projects. Broadly speaking, that is not what banks do in the modern world. Banks can lend money to businesses and entrepreneurs to do capital investment projects, but they can also do at least two other things. They can lend money to consumers, either in a mortgage form or in an unsecured form, to bring forward consumption in the life cycle. Could be welfare enhancing if it optimally smoothes consumption across a life cycle within a permanent income constraint. And crucially also, they can finance a competition for the ownership of assets that already exists. That can be, for instance, in the private equity market, where much of what private equity does is often not venture capital or new capital investment, but leveraging up against assets which already exist. But by far the biggest element of where they, where they do this leveraging up against existing assets is in real estate. There's a very fine piece of work by economists uh, uh, Alan Taylor and colleagues at UC Davis who've analyzed 17 major, econo e major advanced economy banking systems over the last 140 years. And their conclusion is quite simple, and I quote, with very few exceptions, the bank's primary activity up to the 1920s and even the 1970s was non-mortgage lending to business. But by 2007, banks in most countries had turned primarily into real estate lenders. The intermediation of household savings for productive investment in the business sector, which is the standard textbook role of the financial sector, constitutes only a very minor share of what modern banking systems do today. So by banks are not primarily doing what the textbooks say they do. Most modern banking systems and most capital market credit systems, securitized credit uh, in the US, is not doing this funding of new capital investment by uh, businesses, which our textbooks say. Now, that, of course, at very least suggests that we should change the textbooks, but it also raises the question as to whether we should change the banks. Should we try and turn them back to what they were 50 years ago, which was things which lent money to businesses? Well, I want to not leap immediately to that conclusion, because let me, well, having suggested that there might be a problem with this, all this real estate lending, suggest also that we're not going to get rid of it, and we mustn't attack it too much. There is something about modern economies which I think are bound to become more real estate intensive over time. I think as people get richer, they will tend to reach satiation in many categories of consumption. And one thing they will do with an increasing proportion of their rising income is compete more aggressively for the right to live in the nice part of town, for the nice bits of real estate, and effectively for the limited supply urban land on which that real estate sits. So I think it's almost inherent that modern economies become more real estate intensive. And just as an aside, although a lot of people have got very excited by Thomas Piketty's work about the rising ratio of wealth to income in modern economies, 
And though there's a set of theories which Piketty produces, general theories about why that is true, it's very interesting to look in detail at these figures and find out that for most advanced economies, almost all of that increase in the wealth-to-income ratio is an increase in the value of property uh, relative to income. So modern economies are more real estate intensive. And so they are going to have a businesses of providing credit which do provide a useful function in smoothing out the intergenerational and intra intragenerational trading of those real estate assets. We're not going to avoid that. Banks or the capital markets are bound to do a significant amount of real estate lending. But equally, we need to recognize that this strong skew towards real estate is likely to become, unless we are careful, self-reinforcing, possibly harmful, and that banks are likely to become more focused on real estate than is social optimal with adverse macroeconomic and microeconomic effects. Real estate lending, as has been well argued by the economists at the Bank for International Settlement, uh, such as Claudio Borio, have proved to be not just a driver, but the overwhelmingly predominant driver of financial crisis and macroeconomic instability. And that's because when we lend money against real estate and the price of real estate goes up in response to the amount of credit extended, both borrowers and lenders then decide that it would be sensible to borrow and lend some more money and the price goes up and it goes up and up and in a cycle and then we reach a crisis and then we have a post-crisis recession in which the attempt of people to delever puts the economy into a recession. And the fundamental reason, I believe, why six years after 2014, uh, 2008, here in 2014, we are still struggling with a weak and slow recession is not the weakness of the banks, it is the fact that we have over-leveraged households and companies who fundamentally got over-leveraged in commercial real estate and residential real estate. So real estate lending, if there's too much of it, has an adverse social effect, economic and social effect. But it's an adverse social and economic externality because seen from the point of view of the individual bank or credit security investor, it can appear to look low risk and can actually be low risk, even while it is producing those adverse, adverse collective effects. It is quite possible for us to have very strong cycles of credit, real estate prices, crisis, falling real estate prices, what Richard Koo has called a balance sheet recession and a deflation, it's quite possible to have that with very low losses to the banking system itself. Overleveraged households have played a major role in the UK and in the US in explaining the depth of the post-crisis recession. But at least in the UK, the losses this time round on bank lending to residential mortgages have been extremely low, and they have reinforced the belief in the point of view of bankers that bank lending to real estate is a low-risk thing. Bank lending to real estate also appears to be a simpler, easier, cheaper thing than any other form of lending because you can credit score it or you can simply lend on a loan-to-value basis. And if you keep your loan-to-value low, you can be contributing to a collective problem of a credit and real estate boom, but you'll be okay. While lending to a business which does not have real estate assets is tricky, expensive, requires analysis of the business activity, and can be risky. Left to itself, the banking system will overprovide credit for real estate purchase, and indeed also for real estate investment, though I haven't covered that, and will underprovide credit for business investment, business development, and business innovation. And that justifies public policy interventions both to constrain and manage overall levels of credit and to produce a different allocation of credit than a purely free market model would produce. But the precise appropriate policy interventions must vary according to where we think the key deficiencies of the positive provision of credit lie. And I want to end by suggesting that it might lie, though might not, in three different places, and that we need to have clarity about which of these problems we're trying to solve because according to which one you're trying to solve, we then have different proposals. You could be worried by a problem of, as it were, general business development, that there will be too much credit to house purchasers, to buy-to-let investors, to commercial real estate investors, and there won't be enough credit to small and medium enterprises 
in general across the board. Whether or not they're innovators or whether they're not trying to build a restaurant business or a garage business, there just won't be enough for business in general. If that is the problem we are trying to solve, one of the things we could do is to change the capital risk weights within the banking system. At the moment, we allow banks to set how much capital they have according to a private assessment of risks. That's what the Basel II and Basel III capital risk weights do. And looked at from a private point of view, residential mortgages often get rated at 10%. You only need 10% of the full amount of capital you would otherwise be. Small and medium lo loans, uh, uh, non not against real estate, tend to be about 100% or so. We could change that. We could set higher capital requirements against real estate lending, essentially to reflect the social externality of real estate lending, which no individual private banker will ever take into account. Suppose, however, point two, that we were worried not about general business development, but about innovation. Are we worried about innovation? Are we worried not just that there's too much lending to real estate and not enough to general business development, but about funding breakthroughs in science and technology? I don't know the answer to that. Let me give you an example. I've just signed a letter with various other people asking for a global challenge product, project equivalent like putting a man on the moon uh, in order to drive the development of solar energy technology and battery technology, which I, like other people, believe are fundamental breakthrough technologies. But did the Apollo mission in the 1960s it certainly required a lot of public expenditure, a lot of public science support, a lot of a, a orchestration. Was the supply of debt finance important or not? I don't know. Other people around here may know. But I don't know how important within the specific issues of driving specific innovations like solar uh, technology breakthroughs and battery technologies breakthroughs are a, a debt finance issues. If they are, then I suspect that we have to be willing to step in with actual direct government support or specific government guarantees rather than simply playing around with the risk weights. Finally, infrastructure development. Suppose we weren't just worried about small and medium enterprises and general business development, nor about innovation specifically, but suppose we were worried about infrastructure development, by which we might mean transport or power supply or transmission not the breakthroughs in solar energy, but who's going to fund the installation of large-scale solar energy or the installation of large-scale uh, wind energy. Here I have to say it is less immediately obvious why there should be a market failure or bias similar to that which skews the private sector towards real estate away from general business investment or which leads to underinvestment in necessary innovation. You could argue that one thing the business might do, the free market business might do, is at some price be willing to fund long-term infrastructure. I suspect that the biggest issue on this third issue is at what price, and that the crucial issue is about risk and return, in which case the most important levers may be not simply trying to change the guts of the financial system, but trying to change the guts of where the risk lies recognizing that one thing that the public sector can do, whether it be through development banks, or whether it be through guarantees, or whether it be through the design of utility regulation, is take risk off the table because it is a better manager of risk and get down the cost of infrastructure finance, even if that infrastructure finance comes from the private sector. Those, therefore, are three questions that I end up with are we talking about general business development, about technological innovation per se, or infrastructure development? I think the policy levers will differ, but the background, at least in relation to debt, is do not rely on the private sector left to itself to end up in a socially optimal space. The private sector left to itself will gravitate inevitably not only to the necessary element of real estate finance, but far too much real estate finance than makes sense in a socially optimal fashion. Thank you.